We've almost completed our journey through the Apostle Paul's letter uh, to the believers, his beloved as he refers to them at Philippi. Today we find ourselves in chapter 4 and uh, the question for today's message or today's study in the word is this, what makes you anxious? And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know ahead of time that uh, uh, this sermon, uh, as I was putting it together, made me anxious. I'll explain more of that later. Um, but as I've told you in the past, uh, many times the messages uh, are speaking directly into my life. Um, this is one that uh, is uh, speaking tremendously in my life as I wrestle uh, with uh, anxiousness. Uh, so what makes you anxious? Does the condition of the world today make you anxious? Does politics make you anxious? Now, some of you don't have to answer that question. I've seen your Facebook pages, so I know that politics makes you anxious. Ooh. That statement made me anxious. <laughs> Wasn't even in my notes. Does the condition of relationships make you anxious? Your relationship with your spouse, your children, relatives and your family, friends, neighbors, Someone in the church, as Paul mentions in our text today, he's going to talk about that. Does the condition of the company that you work for make you anxious? Does your relationship with a boss or your co-workers make you anxious? Does the condition of your employment make you anxious in the world that we're in right now with uh, a lot of things going on in businesses, right-sizing, downsizing, and capsizing? Um, does the condition of your health make you anxious? Maybe there's material matters that make you anxious. Does the condition of your finances, your bills, your house, your college loans, or some other material matter make you anxious? Does conflict make you anxious? What stuff, what stuff in this life makes you anxious? Now, I could not think of a better way to start off a message on anxiety than ask a bunch of questions about being anxious. The problem with asking those questions is that I probably just made you anxious this morning. <laughs> In an effort to be transparent on this subject matter, I'm going to do some confession to you this morning in the message. Um, because there's a number of things uh, that I have to admit that makes me anxious, that give me pause and give me anxious thoughts in this life. Um, let, me, let me lay out a couple of them for you. For the most part, a lot of the things that make me anxious are things I fear. Um, uh, I fear not being successful as a husband, a father, uh, and providing for my children and my family. I, feel not being, I fear not being effective in ministry as a pastor and managing the church well. I fear not being a good friend uh, to those uh, around me who call me friend. And all of these fears can uh, be very anxious. And you might question, I did write this in my notes, you might question, wait, you're a pastor. How can a pastor have such difficulty of being anxious over such things? Well, my answer to that is simply this. I'm like the Apostle Paul. He wrote these words in Romans chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am in the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing or practicing the very thing I hate, being anxious. But if I do practice the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I hate, that I don't want. But if I'm doing the very thing that I don't want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin that dwells in me. I don't want fears to cause me to be anxious, but I'm like Paul, unfortunately. I practice, just like Paul stated here, the very thing I don't want to do. Anxiety is rampant, folks, in our culture today. 
Just this past week, I read an article online related to a study that was being done on the substantial increase in mental health days off by the workforce in America. Okay? There's been a huge increase in uh, uh, companies uh, taking care of and paying for mental health days off uh, in uh, our world because of the anxiousness in our society. Over the past few weeks, I've been doing a bit of research myself, asking questions of others related to this idea of being anxious. Uh, when I draw this picture form in this question format, I've been doing kind of a mini survey with a number of people. Have you ever had someone say this to you? There's something I would like to talk to you about, so can we get together sometime to talk? Now, obviously, in the role that I have here at the church, I've had that happen quite often. But in my surveys with others, I found that almost everyone, 100% of the people that I talked to, had had this happen in their life. Somebody come to them that they are connected with and ask that question. From that survey question, I then followed that up with questions like these. Or with a question like this, what is or what are the immediate thoughts that run through your mind when someone comes to you and says to you they want to meet with you, they'd like to talk to you about something? Everyone that I surveyed, their immediate thoughts went to these questions. Listen carefully because you've probably been there. Okay, here's the immediate questions that ran through my mind and ran through everybody else. Uh-oh, what have I done? Right? Y'all been there with me, right? Or, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? Right? Or, what happened and how bad is it? <laughs> right? <laughs> I even had one person tell me this. This has happened often with their adult children who don't live at home any longer. And they will actually do this not by a phone or not face-to-face. -face. They will do it via text. Another brilliant way to do this, okay? I just want to let you know. All right? Hey, here's the text. Hey, there's something I would like to talk to you about. Can we find some time later? Just this morning, my sister forwarded me an Instagram from a Christian comedian, John Chris, and he wrote this. I, it was funny that it came this morning on this message that I'm doing, so I, I had to make a tweak to the message I put in here. He, he wrote this on Instagram. I was like, perfect for, my, for the message. She sent it to me. He said this, I don't have panic attacks, but if someone texts me, in the morning and says, I need to talk to you about something. I'll call you after work. Let me just say the day is not going well for me. <laughs> now, this doesn't have to be a family member uh, or a relative. It could be your boss. It could be a team member at work. It could be a coworker, a friend, a neighbor. You name the who in your life. But most likely you have had this happen to you and your thoughts, if there are anything like the rest of the people that I surveyed, had gone in the same direction. I don't know about you, but my follow-up questions, listen, my follow-up questions can, can, to those questions can become very difficult. I can practice tremendous anxiety. Here's why. See, I, like you, can conjure up in my mind a whole bunch of scenarios the person wants to come talk to me about. You ever been there? I can conjure up a whole bunch of scenarios. I can manufacture a whole bunch of thoughts in the time that we have before we actually get together. And those manufactured ideas and those thoughts that I conjure up can take me to some really dark places. Amen? Amen? Anxiety can lead to deeper depression issues and problems and difficulties. It's rampant in our culture today. Shimon County has the highest suicide rate in the state of New York. Highest in the state of New York. It can lead to dark places. So we pick up our scripture today. In verse 1 of Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, I love it when he calls his folks my beloved. That's what Jesus, how Jesus sees us. Therefore, my beloved, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Herodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. 
Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Now, obviously, Paul has received a report that there's difficulty in relationships within this fellowship. There's no good way to determine what the difficulty was. One commentator, Gordon Fee, mentions that because Paul stresses the fact that these women, along with Clement and the other workers there, struggled alongside of him in gospel, that there, probably the difference was related to a difference of opinion on how the ministry should take place. It wasn't so much of an interpersonal relationship. It was more of a difference of opinion, most likely, about how they should advance uh, taking uh, ministry forward in the church. Um, and it involves a number and Paul is engaging the whole uh, group of people there to help them move through uh, and, and arrive at a place of harmony. Paul encourages them to help in resolving the matter that has come up and that they would all uh, be in harmony with one another. Now it is interesting in the flow of this letter and, and mentioning this struggle here where Paul mentions uh, this struggle that Paul moves to a discussion about anxiousness. Now I, I, I think it's interesting that Paul moves to an anxious discussion uh, because Paul gives us a list in 2 Corinthians about the difficulties that he had in ministry and he, as he compared his ministry to others okay and uh, I, from as I read through this list for a minute um, I want you to think about what anxious thoughts Paul might have had he, he said this as are they servants of Christ I speak as if insane I so more so he's comparing himself to these other folks here in Corinthians in far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger, five times I received from the Jews 30, 30 lash, or 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, that isn't Colorado stone, that's stoned. Um, I knew some of you would get that. That was that extra cup of coffee. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights. I hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And then he says, apart from such external things, as a pastor, he says, there is daily the pressure on me for concern for all of the churches. Now, I would not doubt from this list that Paul had experienced anxiousness at some point in his ministry. Just saying. If not often. So Paul coaches here about anxiousness or excuse me, so Paul's coaching here about anxiousness, no doubt, stems from his own personal struggle and his personal experiences as he struggles with the gospel. Exactly what he's coaching this church along with. So back to our text. Because Paul is going to prescribe help in anxiousness. When anxiousness comes, Paul is going to prescribe help for us from the text we're in. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Yeah, but I went LOL, laugh out loud at the end of that. I just want to let you know. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have arrived you have received your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. 
Now that I speak from, not that I speak from want, for I have learned, and listen to Paul, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to get along in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. Both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share in my affliction. They were taking care of Paul while he was in prison. So what is the first thing? There's a prescription here by Paul for anxiousness. What is the first thing that he prescribes for anxiousness? He says twice in one sentence that we should rejoice in the Lord. And I take that word rejoice as worship. We should rejoice in the Lord. We should worship as we rejoice. All right? Now, worship happens a number of different ways. Obviously, one of the ways to rejoice in the Lord and worship is to do it with song. I find myself often singing songs in my heart that help me worship, especially when I'm anxious. Any of you do that? And it's fantastic, especially when those songs have biblical messages. One of my favorite songs lately is a song by Zach Williams, and it's titled, Fear is a Liar. I mentioned the fear that I have and begin anxious about. In a father, and a husband, a provider, and a pastor. Listen to the lyrics from this song. By the way, there's some fantastic lyrics in our modern songs. I just want to let you know. And when you learn them and they come in your heart, they're fantastic. There's great, there's great lyrics in hymns and there's great lyrics in our songs that we have today. And by the way, there's junk in both as well. I'll just let you know. Okay? The lyrics goes like this. When he told you you were not good enough, when he told you you were not right, when he told you you are not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he told you you're not worthy, when he told you you're not love, when he told you you're not beautiful, that you'll never be enough, fear, he is a liar. Who's the liar? Right? Fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath. Stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar. He will rob you. He will rob your rest. Steal your happiness. Cast your fear in the fire. Because fear is a liar. Pretty good text, isn't it? Pretty good lyrics, isn't it? When he told you you were troubled, you're forever, you'll forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'll never find a home. When he told you you were dirty, and you should be ashamed. When he told you you could be the one that grace could never change. Fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar. He will rob you of your rest, steal your happiness. Cast your fear in the fire. Because fear is a liar. Pretty good text. Song I've been singing in my heart. Especially this week as I was preaching on anxiety. He wrote another song. I won't give you all the lyrics to it. Same guy. It's called No Longer Slaves. And it goes like this. I, I'm no longer a slave to fear. For I am a child of God. From my mother's womb. You have chosen me. Your love has called my name. Amen. That's who we are. Or his beloved. I've been born again into your family. Listen, your blood flows through my veins. Amen? I'm his beloved. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave for, of fear. I am a child of God. Worship helps me Remove anxiousness. There's anxiousness. There's other, there's other ways to worship. Offering words of praise is another form of worship. By the way, that can happen anytime, anywhere. And I would challenge you to do that in the middle of Walmart. Just saying. 
It might be a witness. Can I get testimony in the middle of Walmart? Praise the Lord, the price dropped 5%. More money for missions. That's a great way to praise, all right? Silence before him is another way to worship. Just listening to him speak to your heart in silence is another way to worship. Here's a problem in our culture today. We pack our schedules with too much stuff. We can never sit still and listen. Amen? It's a form of worship. Silence. It's a form of helping with anxiousness. Do you worship when anxiousness comes? How do you worship with anxiousness? So that's the first thing Paul prescribes. The second thing Paul prescribed for anxiousness is to respond with a gentle spirit. Again, in an effort to be transparent, as I wrestle with anxiousness in my own life, I am wired like Paul, so gentleness is not one of my best attributes. Ask my wife. Ask my kids. In fact, I would say this, that I have to make a tremendous effort to be gentle in spirit as Paul coaches here. Remember, Paul learned gentleness. you got to think about Paul's ministry. Paul learned gentleness over the course of his ministry as he becomes very gentle at the end of his ministry when he praises John Mark's ministry even after the dust-up that caused them to separate. You remember the story, right? John Mark quit halfway through the first missionary tour. Paul was upset with that. Barnabas suggested John Mark come along on the second one, and Paul said what? Not so. It's not going to happen. Gently, Paul said it. No, Paul probably didn't say it gently because it ruined the relationship between him and Barnabas for a time. But Paul grows over the course of ministry. God's not done with me yet. He's not done with you. Amen? And in the middle of anxiousness, it's not easy to be gentle in spirit. But Paul prescribes that. Being gentle in spirit is something that takes effort. Now, I'm not making an excuse for my lack of it. I'm just telling you I ain't there yet. Is he done with you? He's not done with me. Amen? When anxiousness comes... With whatever circumstance or situation that you're dealing with, is a gentle, is a gentle spirit, the, spirit the way you respond, or do you respond in a not-so-gentle way? Paul, Paul's second prescription here. Third prescription. Paul prescribes for anxiousness is this, prayer and supplication before God, but he qualifies that prayer and supplication with two words that I think are very interesting. These two words are with thanksgiving. Okay, so before I... Be- Try me now. There? Hey, hey, there we go. I have no idea where I was now. Here we go. Third thing. I think it's third thing. Paul prescribed for anxiousness is prayer and supplication. He said with thanksgiving. Before I get to with thanksgiving, let's talk about prayer and supplication. Because from the Greek, they mean two different things. And it was real interesting doing a bit of a study, on a word study on these two words. All right? Paul lists both of them in this anxious passage. Okay? So let me explain prayer. From the Greek word that's used here by Paul, prayer is typically seeking God on behalf of others. It's intercession, if you will. It's me praying for you, you praying for me. Intercession, all right? Supplication is humbly asking God for my own personal needs, okay? There's a difference between these two words. That's why Paul uses both of them here. Therefore, Paul has prescribed both prayer and supplication in the middle of anxiousness. In everything that we do, especially 
in the middle of situations that are causing us or issues that cause us anxiousness, anxiousness in our lives. Then Paul added the phrase with thanksgiving when he coached prayer and supplication. Let, let me say it to you. Have you ever tried offering thanksgiving for a person or a situation before making requests to God for others and yourself? Have you ever tried that? Have you ever done that? Here's what I want to tell you. It is way easier to have a gentle spirit when you're praying and supplicating for your, someone else and yourself in the midst of anxiousness when you offer thanks. It's way easier for me. In fact, what's good about it is I start to have the heart of God in a situation. With others and with myself, I start to have the heart of God. And I'll be honest with you, one of the things that happens with me is I start thinking, Lord, if there's any evil way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. She takes me to repentance when I start offering thanks before I start telling him what I want. See? I found it tremendously changes my prayer and my supplication as I seek God on behalf of others or myself or the situation. Because God has a different agenda for my heart. When I bring him my requests as they relate to an anxious situation or a setting, and thanksgiving opens the door to his heart for my heart. I've done this in my personal life. I don't do it enough. But when I offer thanksgiving, especially thanksgiving for a specific matter... It changes the whole dynamic of the situation. And it takes my focus vertical rather than horizontal. It changes the whole dynamic. I found myself, I can get pretty wound up. And I can ask God for a whole bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with a situation. But when I change the direction to thanksgiving, it changes the situation. It changes the turmoil. It changes the focus. And the promise here is that the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We'll have the mind of God. The fourth thing that Paul prescribed for anxiousness is to dwell on what is right. Remember I said earlier that it is real easy to go down the wrong path and dwell on what you want rather than dwelling on what he wants and what is right. Paul says here, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. It's not easy in the middle of an issue, a material issue or a personal issue or a situation. It's not easy in any of them that causes anxiousness to dwell on what is right. It's really easy to dwell on what we want. Amen? But what I want and what God wants, a lot of times, are entirely different. I took this thought from Gary Thomas in his book titled Sacred Marriage. We're doing that in a men's study that I'm doing. Uh, he was talking about marriage, but I think it applies to this. He says, uh, what if the situation that you're in, this goes along with James chapter 1, 2 through 4 there, who counted all joy, my brethren, when you face many trials. What if the situation or the issue that you have before you that's causing the anxiousness, what if God allowed that not so much to make you happy, but to make you holy? I think that's a great question. What is God's agenda rather than mine? Because his agenda might be to transform me like he transformed Paul. And Paul was becoming gentle in spirit towards John Mark. See, Paul transformed from the beginning of the ministry till we see him in prison, the end of his ministry. Even with all that stuff going on, there was a transformation in Paul. What if it's to make us holy rather than to make us happy. 
The fifth thing that Paul prescribed for anxiousness is to remind them that they should practice the things that they have seen in him. Now, folks, I just want to tell you this. This takes study of the word and ongoing study of the word. If you're going to emulate Paul, who, by the way, said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? It takes study of the word. This is not easy without studying the word on a regular basis, on a continual basis. It's sort of what I talked about a couple of weeks ago when I mentioned the fact of what's at the center of your radar screen. Is knowing Jesus at the center of your radar screen? How much time of knowing Jesus? See, we can't emulate Paul and we can't emulate Jesus if we don't know him. And the only place we get to know him is in the scripture. So Paul prescribes that here. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me. Emulate what I do. Paul is saying that. And we got to know who Paul is. And what he does. If we're going to do that in our life. The sixth thing that Paul prescribes for anxiousness. And this one's probably the one that's the hardest of all. He prescribed learn to be content. Beginning at verse 11, Paul says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In, every, in any and in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled, having my stomach filled, or going hungry. Both of having abundance and suffering needs and then he says I can do all things through him who strengthens me Paul has learned to be content whether he's in abundance or lack whether there's food on the table or there's lack thereof whether there is money in the bank or there's none Paul has learned to be content in all things and here's why because He's God's beloved. That's who he is. Paul knows his identity. He's a child of God, a citizen of heaven on loan to earth. But he knows the one who has him in the palm of his hand. He's content. Much of the time, our anxiousness is related to us not being content. Amen? Right? We want things the way we want them. And if they are not the way we want them, do anxiousness follows. Doesn't it? Because we're not content. And anxiousness follows. And then a whole bunch of other stuff that isn't right, isn't pure, isn't holy follows. Amen? Y'all with me? Right? Right? So I'll return to the question that I asked at the beginning of the message. What makes you anxious in this life? And then the follow-up question. Can practicing Paul's prescription here be helpful to you? And then the follow-up question to that is this. Where should you begin? Where does it start? I'll be honest with you. For me, it's an inward look. It's an inward look at my heart. And my walk. And my vertical relationship with him. It's an inward look. Let's pray as the worship team comes to close in song. I pray, Father God, as we sing, I surrender all, that our hearts would be surrendered to your speaking to us through your Holy Spirit this morning. I know your word is speaking directly into my life. I pray, Father God, it won't return void. It's speaking into the lives of your folks that are here. I pray, Father God, your word is not intended to go out and return void. It's intended to have an effect in our lives and a transformation process in each one of us. I pray. God, that's what your Holy Spirit would do in our hearts this morning as we come before you. May you fulfill your word in us this morning as we attempt to emulate Paul who followed Jesus.
and become deeper disciples who walk deeply with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We'll sing together this morning.